seminar. My special thanks to the panelists uh, who are sitting on the desk. Thanks very much, Dr. Mohan, for uh, being with us for the opening remarks. And uh, just with one request, because we are quite time bound, with one request, put your phones on silent mode so that we can proceed uh, smoothly. Over to you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rajesh, uh, for organizing this. Um, this uh, work has been going on at CSEP for almost three years. Um, and um, it, in fact, it started before the Glasgow summit. Um, and then, of course, we were delighted uh, when the Prime Minister made uh, his um, um, commitments uh, in Glasgow uh, to set the net zero emissions target for 2070. And so that gives a very, very clear uh, green light to uh, the whole uh, energy sector along with other sectors that affect uh, emissions um, and a lot of that work is going to do with the power sector, of course, the energy sector, but also vehicles, uh, all the electric vehicles, and uh, so many other things. Um, we had, uh, in our work, uh, led by uh, Dr. Rajesh Chadha, uh, we had actually started work earlier on mining sector as a whole, because it's very... Uh, the mining sector, strangely, uh, is uh, um, not very well researched. And also, I would say, even though the Joint Secretary Mines is here, who will welcome in a few minutes, um, it's also not been among the highest policy attention that it has got ever since reform started now 32 years ago. Um, so that's why we started the mining work, and as we were doing the mining work, uh, we then obviously came across the critical minerals issue, um, and then uh, along with the other work going on at CSEP uh, on the energy sector, it became clearer to us that so much of the energy transition, uh, climate change work, will eventually depend on critical minerals. So the, criti the critical is indeed the right word. They're really critical, actually. Because uh, as we expand the uh, renewable energy uh, supply, um, since, of course, uh, it's uh, time of day dependent, uh, also seasonal, um, there will have to be a lot of storage if you're going to get good 24-7 uh, power. Because the only other alternative, if, if we don't get enough storage, is they'll have to use a lot of uh, fossil fuel energy. And to the extent that the share of renewable energy in the world is still very low, already uh, the problems are beginning in terms of supply of critical minerals. So that's how we started our work. Then, of course, we were encouraged, as I said, by the Prime Minister's announcement of the zero emissions target of uh, of 2070. Um, so that's sort of the background for all this. Um, we uh, first uh, had an edition on critical minerals uh, 2021, and uh, this is the uh, second edition released in April 2023. We were delighted uh, since we've been doing this work very quietly without telling anyone really. Um, that the Ministry of Mines noticed this work and started consulting Dr. Chadha and his team. And so we were obviously really happy that the Ministry of Mines came out, uh, appointed a group, uh, consulted many uh, academics, uh, researchers, etc., and have indeed come out with a relatively comprehensive critical minerals list. Uh, now the question is, 
having come out with this, how what we do going forward in terms of securing uh, our share in some sense, what we will need in critical minerals for all the storage, electric vehicles, and so on. Um, so, uh, the, the, so uh, this, we, we very, this is going to be very important. And among some other work that we're also doing at CSEP mm -hmm. is that it will also have foreign policy implications. And which is why we have Hiranjan Matai here, uh, who has indeed, of course, worked as a very distinguished ambassador uh, in different places in the Foreign Service. So the, the point I'm making is that even though people might think, what is the critical mineral? What is the small thing you're talking about? Actually, is going to be the new oil. And just as oil has really impacted all kinds of strategic uh, activities to do with the Middle East and other oil producing nations, this is going to be extremely important from an overall strategic point of view. And every country's foreign policy, and particularly any large country's foreign policy. So this is what I understand from all this. Um, the uh, are very, we are absolutely delighted that uh, Mr. Suman Berry, um, uh, Vice Chairman Niti Ayog, has indeed also found it important enough to come today to attend this. But he actually uh, has a background also in the sense that he was among the first people who encouraged us on our mining work and uh, was a member of the Advisory Council for the Non-Fuel Minerals and Mining. He uh, took over as a Vice Chairman Niti Ayog. All, so we uh, owe him a special word of thanks. Um, however, he's, I said he, until he was the uh, member, uh, until he became vice chairman of uh, Niti Ayog, but I don't see why that shouldn't, why that should stop him from continuing to be a member of a distinguished advisory council. And if since he's only vice chairman, we make him chairman of the advisory council. So that'll be a promotion uh, for him uh, if you make him chairman of the advisory council. Um, the uh, let me just very brief, uh, uh, Mr. Berry, uh, actually I have been associated with him to his regret uh, for 58 years. Um, it'll be, we will have a 60th anniversary a couple of years from now. Um, so uh, I watched his whole career from the time that he was 16 years old or 15 and a half years old. Um, he of course worked for the World Bank. Uh, he joined the World Bank uh, when he was a baby. And then he spent uh, 28 years there to become an adult. And uh, he then succeeded me, actually, as the Director General of the National Council of Applied Economic Research. And after that, he became Chief Economist for Royal Dutch Shell, which also then, of course, indicates his interest in energy. Um, he has been a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, India's Statistical Commission, and also the Reserve Bank of India's Technical Advisory uh, Council Committee on Monetary Policy, which was a precursor to the MPC in the Reserve Bank. Um, Ranjan Mathai is, uh, of course, I just said, a distinguished ambassador for foreign service. He has uh, served in Vienna, Colombo, Washington, Tehran, and Brussels, and has been ambassador to France, Israel, and Qatar, um, before serving, of course, as the Foreign Secretary, 2011 to 13. Uh, he also was, just before he retired or just before he left, um, our High Commissioner in the UK, uh, 2013 to 2015. But he's been very interested in the importance of mining to uh, India's national security and also uh, on critical minerals in particular. Um, we are very happy, uh, Veena, that you are here with us. Veena Kumari Dermal, who is Joint Secretary of Ministry of Mines. She belongs to the 1998 batch of the Indian Postal Service. Uh, I'm very glad that the uh, government of India now thinks that people other than IS who can do good work. Uh, so I'm very happy that you are uh, Joint Secretary of Ministry of Mines and have led this work on critical minerals. Um, she joined the Ministry of Mines in 2017. So you've actually been there for six years in the ministry, which is unusual. Uh, for anyone uh, in the government. Um, she was pivotal in making amendments to the MMDR in 2020 and 2021. And Rajesh, I think that later on, we should also have some discussions with her 
on the MMDR and uh, Act and what more needs to be done. Uh, so these, these have a, obviously a great understanding of mineral policy in India, having been in the ministry for six years. Um, she is a uh, government's director on the NALCO, Bharat Gold Mines. Uh, do you, being a director on Bharat Gold Mines, do you get some gold? Uh, oh, no, it's a close as, company. <laughs> yeah. as board meeting fees, sitting fees, um, and also Hindustan Zinc and Kabil. Uh, Pankaj Satija uh, is the managing director of Tata Steel uh, Mining. Uh, he is a graduate uh, engineer from IIT, which is the Indian School of Mines in Dhanbad, and with a PGDM from XLRI and Jam XLRI is Jamshed program. Yes. Um, and he's a certified coach uh, from Ericsson Coaching International. But what? Yes, Co sir. Coach golf or? No, it's 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 Executive coaching. Executive coaching. Oh, oh, I see. I think maybe basketball or wrestling or something. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's a certified <laughs> coach. Uh, he has been on the task force for SDF, for the mining industry, for the Ministry of Mines. Um, and under his leadership, the Sukinda mine of Tata Steel became the first in the country where a pilot launch of SDM was done in 2016. Um, the <clears throat> Uh, he received the National Geoscience Award 2022, the FIMI Gem Granite Sustainability Award 2014-15, and the Bal Bala Gulshan Tandon Excellence Award from FIMI for 2016-17. So, uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, as usual, I've gone on a bit longer than I should have. Uh, so, now my job is over. So, I'll take my sign board here and Rajesh will face me will then moderate the discussion. Thank you very much Dr. Mohan for, yeah, for, for the opening remarks where you have also introduced the panelists. I have a, a special uh, privilege of welcoming Mr. Suman Berry, uh, who has been my director at National Council of Applied Economic Research for 10 years. And, and that, yes, <laughs> and prior to that, yeah, I, I know because you see, prior to that, Dr. Mohan was the director general. So uh, it's my proud privilege, actually, it is my humble privilege as well as proud privilege that I am speaking in between my two Directors General, and incidentally, we met Dr. Mohan again, B. Sal Bad, when he came from Yale to uh, CSEP. So it has been a privilege working with both of you. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Berry, for being on the advisory council. And actually, I think starting the mining research program here, I, I, I should be upfront. And thank you very much for that. Uh, given that we are time constrained, we will now have the keynote. Uh, I invite uh, Mr. Perry to deliver the keynote. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. And I don't want everybody to feel that this is a closed shop with everybody thanking each other. But you know, let me say that in my new role, uh, I do have to worry about being uh, somewhat even-handed. And the fact that my appearances at NCAR and CSEP way exceed um, uh, my my invitations, let me put it that way, elsewhere, um, I think reflects uh, not just uh, sentiment and nostalgia, but actually the fact of the quality of the work. And I do have to say that, um, I mean, this started off as being uh, non-fuel minerals. And what do you know? Suddenly, these minerals start to be as important for energy as coal and, um, well, particularly coal and also oil and gas, which is not to say that CSEP has not had a very uh, important um, work program on coal, uh, I think. And um, we have Lavish Pandari, the new president, who uh, has looked at the uh, fiscal dimensions of the energy transition. So I would say that... Uh, to a degree that's exemplary, CSEP has been working systematically at various levels uh, on 
so many different aspects of what is the huge challenge facing India. And what is that huge challenge? That huge challenge is to become a developed economy while uh, not relying on fossil sources to the extent that uh, all of our predecessors did. And it is a testament, I would say, to the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister that he, I think, uh, I, I think uh, 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 Ambassador Mathai perhaps would not disagree, to some extent took on the received wisdom of the bureaucracy in signing up at COP21 to being a part of the whole clean movement, because that had not been the, 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 the attitude um, uh, prior to that had been, this is a problem created by others and we have to grow. Um, and so we are where we are. So um, I came here, yes, to signal the, um, the quality of the work, but also the importance of this whole area. Um, and um, as has been indicated by both um, Dr. Mohan and Dr. Chadda, um, my engagement was actually on the issue of mining. And I'm pleased that on the panel, I may not be able to stay to the end, we have uh, uh, representatives from the Ministry of Mines because uh, we had Dr. Uh, Rajesh Rao uh, at Niti Aayog, I think he was an AS in the mines ministry. So all I'm saying is that there's been a lot of movement and activity in the regulatory framework for mines. And, you know, this is a slow business, but what one tended to hear in the advisory group was that uh, so far the results had been underwhelming. And I think before we get on to critical minerals, we have to ask two questions. So does the criticality of the minerals make it, or do we know how to get around the constraints and bottlenecks that have held up all mining just because the minerals have become more critical now? And I think that's an issue that we have to, uh, have to face. Um, and when I go to some of the states uh, which are uh, mineral rich, uh, you know, there, um, and I'm not saying this is necessarily um, also including the non ferrous min min minerals, but there are a lot of complaints about the deal that the states get environmentally and in terms of restitution from PSUs, and a lot of this tends to be in the PSUs. So the first point I, I wanted to make is okay, you know, we can see this, you know. Um, this oncoming train, but if we are not able to fix, on the one hand, the issues connected with minerals, in the way that if we are not able to fix the issues connected with um, with transmission, uh, you know, then a lot of the stuff kind of becomes secondary. And so, part of I think uh, what we need to uh, understand is how does making a mineral critical get around all the constraints that have bedeviled the sector up till now. Now, on the issue of critical minerals, um, I mean, there's very fine, not only analytic work, but what I might call um, almost taxonomic work. I mean, the, 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 the two papers produced by the team, by Ganesh and Rajesh, you know, just gives you a clear structure within which to think about these things. So there's, you know, on the one hand, there's uh, uh, extraction and processing, and it turns out that the lead of China is really much more in processing than it is in extraction, then coming to the domestic uh, um, scene, and um, I don't want to steal Rajesh's thunder, this is all probably all in his presentation, but it's part of the educative role, I think, of the work that he and Ganesh has done, and this is hard, word, hard won knowledge. I don't think they knew all this three years ago, and it is by you know continuing uh, down this path that they are able to present the issues with the clarity, and I think Rakesh, he claimed that he read everything that was published by, by CSEP. So let me give you, allow you to take a bow as well on the uh, very uh, clear um, 
um, a presentation. Um, the, so uh, the question being, how much of the focus should be on extraction? How much on processing? Um, and I think the uh, the reference to Atman Nirbharta basically indicates that you get an increase in energy security if the mineral is um, domestically extracted and processed. I think that's an assumption that we should test critically because uh, I. My own view is that, uh, as it were, diversification of all kinds is probably a better way of ensuring security. So the first point was, is there a minerals issue that we need to solve before we can think about critical minerals? The second issue is that, uh, yes, by all means, we should pull out all the stops, but uh, does that mean or what does that mean in term terms of our cross-border engagement in this whole area? And on the cross-border dimension, uh, you know, I think uh, there is a lot going on. I know that not all critical minerals are connected with electric vehicles, but I think quite a large part of them are. And within electrical vehicles, it's largely batteries and battery technology. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, so two points. One, I don't know, and maybe we'll learn in the presentation, that our EV strategy is fundamentally different from what's going on in China, the EU, and uh, the US, in that, as I understand, it's around public transport, and it's around two and three wheelers. Uh, four wheelers are there, but it's uh, but they are not the dominant part of our EV kind of supply chain. Whether that makes a difference or not, I don't know. But I think it's important to know that the path we're going down is a different path from from the big boys. But the the much more important uh, point I think uh, was brought out. Uh, I was uh, at um, in the U.S. Uh, um, on the program at a uh, um, at a conference at the Peterson Institute, and uh, one of the speakers there was somebody called uh, Jennifer Harris, who had been in the in their National Security Council, and she indicated, uh, as you probably know, that there was this Inflation Reduction Act, which has uh, made huge subsidies available particularly for electric vehicles and other dimensions. And she made it clear that basically the intention is to try and move whole supply chains out of China to trusted partners. And the question of what kind of global um, compact, global architecture we need so that we don't end up where we've ended up with LNG, where at, at the moment of uh, uh, crisis in Europe, all the LNG cargoes have been bid away from India. So the same thing could happen with lithium. It could happen with all these other things. And I would commend to those of you who have access uh, to the Financial Times, uh, you know, this uh, article by Jennifer Harris, which basically says that we've got to start treating these critical minerals as uh, essentially as essential commodities where there is a need for global management. And I would just point out to you that in the India-US joint statement, and um, Ambassador Mathai would, um, uh, would be able to illuminate this better than I can, but uh, in Pala 19, they say that India and the United States committed to create innovative investment platforms that will effectively lower the cost of capital and in attract international private finance at scale to accelerate the deployment of greenfield renewable energy, battery storage, and emerging green technology projects in, um, uh, in India. And it goes on to uh, talk about um, 
Prime Minister Modi and President Biden affirm the intention of the two governments as trusted partners to work together to ensure that our respective markets are well supplied with the essential. I'll wait. As, as... Um, um, the essential critical minerals needed to achieve our climate, economic, and strategic technology cooperation goals. So I think I've used up uh, more than my time. So I'm making the point that solving the mining problem is essential, which is a federal problem, uh, that if there are accelerators for critical minerals, I don't know if they're adequately identified, and the Mines Ministry can indicate to that. But for Atma the Bhatta to th imply that we can be self-sufficient at a time for a scramble is probably wrong. And so exactly as was mentioned, the diplomatic dimensions and the cross-border dimensions and the FDI dimensions and the investment treaty dimensions become as important as the overall architecture as just the supply side. I leave it at that and I look forward to your and Ganesha's presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Berry, for your encouraging words and guiding words towards what we should be looking forward to uh, working for, for the future. Uh, we have a brief 10 minute because we have panelists who would be guiding us on various aspects. We have a brief 10 minute presentation that Ganesh and Karthik will be making. And before that, uh, may I invite you, uh, Dr. Mohan and uh, Dr. Bhandari, for a, for a release picture that we never had earlier. And so please come, Ganesh. And I think I saw Mr. Mah Mahta. Uh, please, please join us for, for just in, I, I saw you coming. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much. And now I invite uh, Ganesh and Karthik, who have been my co authors on the new volume that has been published, to make a 10 minute presentation, not more than that, because we have to hear from the panelists then. Hi, I hope I'm audible. Hello, everyone. Kanish and I will now be taking you through a brief summary of the paper and be showing some key highlights of the paper. Um, um, sorry for that. Um, so, we're, the paper on critical uh, the critical assessment uh, from us has a background, and we would like to share the context of it. Uh, we all know how essential critical minerals are, as we've heard from various speakers here. It's a key factor of production for various min minerals, for, for various uh, products. And the most important product that critical minerals are essential for is green technology. In, it is vital for India's COP20 commitments for, uh, for net zero emissions, and therefore they become very, very important for India's economy as well. Strategic minerals is a term that you would see used in various government reports. The reason being that they are also strategically important as they are essential for the manufacturing of military and defense equipment. The objective of the study overall is to go ahead and help in securing min uh, supply chains 
by making and by assessing the building mineral wise strategies for india our second edition takes from takes from our first edition which was on 23 minerals we expanded the scope of a study to include it more minerals and make it a 43 mineral study we also expanded our methodology and added few more indicators the critical assessment uh, the critical minerals assessment work was earlier done by the plan commission and the indian mine and was also in the indian mineral inventory but there, there was only a mention of strategic minerals and not a proper assessment study. The first ever criticality assessment in India was taken up by the, by the Department of Science and Technology and CEW, first in the year 2014 and 2016. The National Mineral Policy further emphasized on the exploration and used the term critical minerals within the policy. At CSEP, we furthered the objective of this of criticality framework and came up with our first assessment study in 2021 and then in 2023, which is our latest report being discussed today. Critical assessment is done by major economies all over the world. Australia, EU, the United States, all do critical assessments for minerals based on their economic need. Here, these, these studies are done periodically every three years and India would also then have to do periodic assessments uh, so, so on and so forth. For these assessments, both demand and supply side are two factors that are assessed before we get to the criticality framework. We, in our paper, use the EU methodology. While we use the EU methodology, we do differ from the methodology in some ways, add a few indicators, which we'll further discuss. As uh, Mr. Berry also pointed out to us, that the geographic concentration becomes a very important factor. Through this, uh, we think that India would be able to, the, the assessment of criticality becomes important in framing policies to combat such geographical co uh, concentration. As can be seen on this slide, the, for instance, for cobalt, the, uh, the Republic of Congo ends up extracting over 70% of the minerals, while on the processing side, it is largely done by China. Similarly for lithium, while the extraction is largely by Australia, over, about 50% of the same mineral is processed purely in China. Therefore, it is important that the ass criticality assessment is done because the criticality assessment allows us to make focused policies on minerals and focus policies towards what minerals need to be assessed and what minerals require strategic concentration. For choosing our minerals, every jurisdiction chooses minerals based on their own economic need, their own economic importance, and how these minerals are applied within their economy. You can see examples of various jurisdictions on the screen and what were the number of minerals they found critical post their latest assessments. Some of these assessments have few minerals in common. You would see these minerals are also common in our study. These minerals are minerals like cobalt, lithium, niobium. These minerals are important because of their end use. The specific end use these minerals go into is green technology, renewable energy, defense, and also batteries, which is, which is the talk of the town right now. For our specific study, we use 43 minerals and they have been assessed. Ganesh will further be also talking about the results of the study. The minerals studied are displayed on the screen here, and these are 43 minerals in total. 23, uh, the 23 uh, edition added more minerals to it and they are highlighted in green. We have also studied rare earth elements in two groups, that is light rare earth elements and heavy rare earth elements. But we would like to point out two minerals in specific that we study separately even though they are rare earth elements. And that is neodymium and scandium. Even, even though they are rare earth elements, they have cross-cutting applications across various sectors and therefore we study it individually within our study. Our CMA methodology includes looking into the economic importance and the supply factors and, and the supply side factors. They have various indicators within it as shown on the screen. These, these, uh, these while are adopted from the EU methodology, there are specific frameworks they've included specifically in the 2023 study. I would invite Ganesh to further explain what these specific indicators are and where did our study go. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karthik, and thank you so much to the panelists for being here. Um, so as Karthik mentioned, we've been using the EU methodology, which separates um, the criticality along two different dimensions. Uh, we have the economic importance, also the demand side factors, and we have the supply risk, the supply side factors. 
Um, so under each, we have a few indicators. So on economic importance, we have these four indicators. The disruption potential. Uh, this is a measure of what share of the manufacturing gross value add would be affected if the mineral becomes non-available. Uh, and this is based on each economy's needs. So in the case of India, we saw that lithium, iron ore, and limestone have high potential for disruption. Uh, substitutability is a measure of uh, if there are other minerals which can take up the same processes that uh, the mineral studied can. Uh, so there are a couple of minerals which we found to have no substitutes for their end use application, including neo niobium and rare earth elements. Um, we also had a new indicator in our study compared to the EU methodology called the GVA, multiplier coefficient. Uh, this is a measure how uh, indirect impacts of a mineral non-availability can affect the manufacturing sectors in India. Uh, and finally, for the economic importance, we also have the cross-cutting index. And this is a measure of how some minerals, such as copper, can be used for a wide variety of final use applications. On the supply side, we have uh, a few more indicators, uh, starting with the concentration, which has been discussed earlier. Uh, this can be both on the extraction and the processing. So there's some minerals like gallium, germanium, and niobium, which have high concentration in extraction. And uh, you may have seen in the news recently how China has put curbs on their exports of gallium and germanium, uh, both essential for semiconductors and other electronics manufacturing. Uh, on the processing side, some minerals like niobium, phosphorus, and scandium have high processing concentration. Uh, we also included uh, the quality of governance of the countries that are either extract or process minerals. Uh, and this is important to understand how uh, the relationship with these countries can work and ease of doing business in those countries. A famous example, uh, infamous example rather, is cobalt mined in uh, Congo and um, how the governance factors could affect mining operations in that region. Uh, we've also included the bottleneck analysis. This is something the EU does and we've included in our recent study. Uh, and here we look at how uh, supply risk could be different based on the extraction and processing. And um, we take the, uh, the, the stage in which the supply risks are higher. For example, uh, in zinc, the processing supply risks for India are higher, uh, whereas in cobalt, the extraction supply risks are higher. Uh, finally, for the end-of-life recycling rates and import reliance, uh, these basically can help dampen supply risks if either we are reducing our import reliance or increasing our recycling rates. Uh, we also looked at substitutability on the supply risk side, and this looks at the substitutes uh, production levels and the ease of mining. Some minerals, for example, are co-mined or are byproducts of other processes, uh, which makes them harder to extract and may increase the supply risks. Finally, uh, the results of our uh, 2023 study. Uh, we have uh, looked at, again, uh, the extraction, sorry, the supply risks and economic importance. Uh, certain minerals may have high supply risks, but not high economic importance and vice versa. Uh, and some minerals, of course, are high on both. And this is what we call critical minerals in our study, of which uh, we have found 22. Uh, of course, the threshold va uh, values that we have chosen are based on our um, judgment. Uh, and this can be changed depending on uh, the context. Um, given the recent announcement by the Ministry of Mines of their list of critical minerals, uh, they have identified 30 minerals as critical for India. Uh, we just thought we can compare some of the minerals and show the overlap between the two lists. Uh, one thing to note is how the Ministry of Mines has uh, decided to avoid using uh, bulk minerals like iron ore, limestone, and bauxite as critical, uh, given that they are bulk minerals and are readily available in India. Uh, finally, we thought we could have um, a couple of policy implications uh, to start with on the domestic side. Uh, we've talked about uh, earlier how we can use the list of critical minerals to underpin uh, a mineral-wise strategy on how to secure supply chains of these minerals for India. Uh, secondly, uh, this is on the mining side or rather the exploration side. Uh, India has a large wealth of mineral uh, resources, but more exploration and investments in exploration is required to harness this. Um, and as uh, Mr. Berry also mentioned, an accelerator for critical minerals uh, would be apt. Uh, finally, um, on the domestic side, uh, more focus on recycling, formalizing the sector, getting up to the global practices uh, would also be quite important. And we have written a bit about how e-waste could be a big source of critical minerals. And on the global side, uh, the global climate cooperation, uh, firstly, trade agreements and the ministry, Kabul, have already worked on uh, MOUs with Australia and other countries, so that's a good start. 
uh, also the acquisition of foreign mineral assets. For minerals we don't have in India, we may have to rely on other countries and uh, perhaps setting up operations in those countries could help. Uh, thirdly, um, recently India has joined the Mineral Security Partnership led by the US, which is a great start. And we've also looked at how the G20 could also be involved and perhaps a Mineral Security Partnership with G20 countries could be a way forward. And finally, um, but not least, of course, is the ESG practices. Uh, this is something that's going to be very important, especially for certain markets where ESG uh, is held to very high standards. And that's something that India should imbibe as well, uh, given the uh, large number of people living over mineral wealth. And I think um, I'll leave it over there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Karthik and Ganesh for making this crisp 10 minute presentation. Uh, now I have the privilege of, you know, in a way slightly uh, making more specific the knowledge that we have gained from Mr. Ranjan Mathai as, as on our uh, advisory board. And we are, we are happy that he has joined us today because he has been writing about the importance of critical minerals in defense and energy security for some years now. Uh, in 2019, he highlighted the implications of national mineral policy 2019 and set the tone for securing access to critical minerals for national security. During the pandemic, uh, Mr. Mathai re-emphasized the need for resilient supply chains of critical minerals and more recently, he has written about the US-led mineral security partnership of which India was not a member last year but has recently become a member. So uh, two things that came uh, up after his last writing is that the Ministry of Mines has already declared 30 critical minerals and obviously India needs to integrate uh, in, into the global supply chains and uh, given that India has joined the MSP how should India take these issues forward during the G20 presidency and onward? I think uh, Mr. Mathai will take around 15 minutes to make a presentation uh, which he has prepared. And uh, so over, over to you, Mr. Mathai, and thanks for coming and joining us. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chadda, and it's a great honor to be with uh, Dr. Suman Berry, Dr. Rakesh Mohan, uh, Dr. Chadda and his team and the other distinguished panelists today. I must start by saying I feel like a rank amateur among professionals. I'm not an economist. I've never worked on minerals. I approach this from a very obscure standpoint of looking at security uh, while I'm being a diplomat. So I'd like to be take the advantage of looking at it not from the kind of professional expertise that you're going to, you've already heard and you're going to hear from. I wanted to talk more about its implications for us as a country. And so I ended up writing more than half an hour and then Dr. Chadda very sternly told me I had only half that time and that was a very big concession. So I'd like to just convey a kind of global and historical overview before turning the focus on India to say, how did we get where we are today? Minerals, as we were told, are suddenly big news. Gallium and germanium, the germ, the Chinese have put these export controls. What is also come in the news is that the United States has invoked the Defense Production Act to make sure it gets enough of these supplies. And I was at the launch of the Ministry of Mines report, and I was really heartened to see the turnout of journalists. Normally, they don't turn up when you have talk about minerals and so on. So that was very good. And the third piece of news, which again filtered through the pink pages, you might say, into the mainstream, was Indonesia being criticized by the EU, and then followed up very quickly by the IMF and by the WTO, for putting a ban on the exports of nickel and uh, bauxite because they want to do more value addition at home. So what is happening? In my view, our high-tech digital world in which we live is discovering that it has mineral roots. And I believe the path to net zero emissions is underlining the criticality and the depth of those roots. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, 
two, three centuries ago, major economic powers have recognized the vital role of key minerals and have adjusted foreign and economic policies to get them. We've had wars and imperial adventures caused by minerals. After the Second World War, the abundance of mineral supplies in the US and the Soviet Union, Russia, as well as the liberalization of global trade gave the whole world a degree of security of supply of minerals for industry. The problem was always oil, not minerals. Major industrial powers depended on their industries investing domestically and specifically more abroad in some of the developing countries to develop these mineral resources. And they relied on trading giants, many of whom are still very not very well known names hidden away in the Swiss Alps, who maintained this free flow of mineral all across the world. But the World War II experience had made both the superpowers maintain stockpiles of critical minerals for defense and other strategic industries, particularly any mineral on which they depended for imports. And I began to read about the Pentagon's uh, stockpile. This US stockpile is maintained by the Defense Logistic Agency of the Pentagon, critical mineral stockpile. In later years, other countries like Japan and Korea and China made specific plans for mineral availability. Some depended on their private sector. China, in 1986, had a, what is called the 863 blueprint of its scientific establishment, which identified strategic metals or materials and rare earths. This program was updated in uh, 1997 and it's now called the 973 blueprint. And it is alleged that Deng Xiaoping said as early as 1992, as there is oil in the Middle East, there are rare earths in China. Whether he said this or not, I don't know, but it certainly is a very relevant thing. And China is believed to have started work on a critical mineral strategy in 2003. But all these developments didn't make news headlines around the world. What changed? Climate change. And the sense of importance of critical minerals has entered the domain, you might say, of general knowledge and general consciousness because of their role in the transition to a world of net zero emissions. Just like oil was the subject of household interest earlier and you could wake up people at night and say, what's worrying you and say oil prices. After the 2015 Paris Accords, minerals became part of the economic discourse. Think tanks began writing and speaking on the subject so did I, as you were told. Around 2016, 17, the goalposts were shifted. And now suddenly it's no longer the Paris consensus we're talking about, it's net zero emissions. And these are two different things. And minerals shot up even further on the global radar. In 2019, the World Bank came out with the first major report on minerals in the energy transition, which I think brought a lot of global recognition to this subject. This was followed up by the International Energy Agency and most recently by the OECD, apart from a whole host of individual countries. And all major economies began making plans for security of supply and what are called critical mineral availability strategies. Why minerals? Because of the specific path chosen for decarbonization. You saw that brilliant map. But if, as a layman, I was asked to explain, I would say, it's because minerals are used in devices for conversion of energy to electric power. The sun and wind have energy, but that's not usable. They, minerals have specific electronic, optical, and magnetic properties. They enhance electrical conductivity, light absorption, generational efficiencies, and the durability of solar power equipment. Magnets enhance the efficiency of wind turbines. Minerals are necessary as catalysts for the electrolyzers which are going to produce your hydrogen. Electrical grids consume huge amounts of minerals like copper. And looking to more industry more generally, in our modern uh, electronic and digital era, these industries are far more important than the smokestacks of traditional industry. Therefore, remember, 60 minerals are used in high-speed integrated circuits and electronic devices, including the mobile phones, which occasionally do ring. So this is uh, one fact we have to keep in mind. And India has committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2070. I 
acknowledge what uh, Dr. Suman Berry has said. I think the Prime Minister was in fact slightly ahead of the bureaucratic establishment when he did that. And mind you, 2070 is nearer than you think. It's just 46 years away. Some of us in this room started our careers more than 46 years ago. Uh, and some of you will still be around in 2070. More relevant than 2070, I think, are the targets which PM announced at Glasgow, which are for 2030, which is six and a half years away. And I certainly hope to be around in six and a half years. Renewable energy is to be stepped up to 500 gigawatts from 170 today. And domestically, the plan for electric vehicles is to go to 30% for cars, 40% for buses, and 70% of the total fleet of two-wheelers. Where are we today? 2%. So that's a long, steep hill we are going to climb. In tandem, the Indian private sector has announced very grandiose plans for hydrogen production, world-scale plans. All this is going to mean a massive increase in mineral requirements if we are to be Atma Nirbhar India, particularly for critical minerals, including rare earth elements. And I'm glad it was properly defined here as those 17 specific minerals. Now, identification, we have been told the two subjects of today. This has been made is easy by the Ministry of Mines, and I'm going to stick with their 30 mineral list because it was done with a lot of consultations and it has looked at all users of minerals. More important, I think it's explained why they are critical, and we have heard this, economic importance, high supply risk, substitu substitutability and import reliance have to be looked at, disruption potential, etc. In terms of their uses for energy transition, high-tech industry, and for India, for food security. So agriculture and fertilizers, thus in addition to the usual suspects we hear, lithium, cobalt, etc., we have potash and phosphorus. I would add that in addition, we need to look long term at minerals required for chemicals and pharmaceuticals because there's an increasing reali realization that the feedstock for these today is entirely petroleum. And once that ends, things are going to have to change. And I think a separate report for the defense ministry on their critical minerals is needed. Securing, first and foremost, Atma Nirbharta. That should be the target for securing these minerals. And the Ministry of Mines report has a very valuable comment from Niti Aayog, which points us in the right direction. It says, India has the capacity to produce and scale up production in India of at least 10 of the identified min min minerals. Technical administrative issues hampering production need to be taken up with the companies concerned. As I understand it, sir, the issues are not administrative and technical, but they are rules, regulations, and tax policies which lies in the domain of government. The Ministry of Mines has in fact acknowledged this by saying that scaling up production is being taken up through policy measures allowing private sector participation and exploration incentives for exploration of deep-seated and critical minerals, etc. That's not adequate. Explorers must be incentivized, otherwise they will not come here. Contiguous mining should be efficiently licensed so that deep underground assets are efficiently extractable and not subjected to rules which apply above the ground. Today, less than 10% of India's obvious geological potential is actually exploited. And I think we heard about this, the center and the states must work together to help us step up. The extraction of minor minerals, as they are called minor minerals, in refining and processing was, I think, very correctly addressed. These are absolutely vital for renewable energy. And what is very often forgotten is that they are very rarely viable for standalone mining. Three years ago, when I identified gallium and germanium, among a host of others, uh, which require incentives for bauxite and zinc refiners to extract from their waste tailings. No one had heard about these. Unbelievably, if you go and talk to industry, you find that uh, the government makes their life even harder if they try to extract these minerals from their wastes in terms of their cost recovery and their taxes. For defense industry, I think we need a critical mineral stockpile on the lines of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which we have established. The second part of securing is the external supplies. Kabil, as we have heard, was set up some years ago, but 
So far, at least the record is that it is not adequately equipped for the ruthless global competition for resources, some of which are scarce and which require instant decision making. And some of these minerals are increasingly going to come under export controls as we have seen. Critical minerals are even more concentrated than oil and a mineral cartel can make OPEC look like weak players. Understanding this requires looking at the supply chain at three levels, geology and mineral extraction, beneficiation, refining, and processing and manufacture of the end use product. At some point in these three processes, lithium, cobalt, rare earths, nickel, bismuth, are dominated by three countries, three countries, and China looms very large. Uh, my view as someone involved with foreign policy is exchanging dependence on OPEC for oil to China for critical minerals is a recipe for disaster. Japan found out to its cost. During PM's, I'm happy to answer if that somebody wants to know what that is. And during PM's visit to in US last month, we heard the Indian membership of the Mineral Security Partnership was announced. And this I wrote about a year ago, and I'm glad it has become more commonly known. It's important to, to enable us to become part of global supply chains. And I think we can go beyond it and build specific critical mineral partnerships and joint ventures with some of these key friendly countries who know a thing or two about both mining and processing. I think it's also important to be part of R&D collaboration to look for alternatives or substitutes. I'll, so what you call substitutability. Take the case of platinum. The OECD report, which the G7 examined last year, says that if we do all the hydrogen we want to do, platinum production in the world has to go up by a factor of 150 by 2050. Does the earth have 150 times the platinum it is extracting today? No one knows. So I think in my conclusion, I'd like to say the time has come not only for critical minerals, but for a new perspective on mining in India. Mining is a messy, costly business. That's why everyone in the world has been happy to leave it to China so far, but that's becoming dangerous. In the world outside, both the climate deniers and the climate alarmists exaggerate their case on the impact, whether environmental, social, or economic, of the massive increase in mining which will be required to achieve net zero emissions. That debate will go on. But capacity for mining and metallurgy will in future become part of the calculus of national power and strategic capability, just as oil is now. As recognition of the importance of minerals grows, we must make use of the opportunity to make better use of our resources. We in India were pioneers of mining and metallurgy in ancient times. Even Kautilya talked about them in the Artha Shastra. We can greatly benefit, I think, not only critical minerals, but say producing gold, silver, and diamonds. The Reserve Bank of India is buying gold from London. I think we could do well to produce a lot more in India. And if you look at these three together and a few other precious metals, India can save over $100 billion in foreign exchange every year and build new industries for itself. Mining's contribution to GDP can be trebled from 2% which we get today, closer to 7.5 to 12 which good mining jurisdictions get. Mining, I think, needs a paradigm shift in the popular perception to a more balanced picture. Net zero imperative highlights the need for minerals and provides an opportune occasion to change the popular discourse. So far, mining has been treated almost like a quasi-criminal activity of people going and digging up the earth, despoiling tribal habitats, violating the sanctity of Mother Earth, and so on. I think the work the CSEP is doing is very timely in changing that paradigm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks once again, Mr. Berry, for coming and joining us. Okay, I think we heard uh, very illuminating views on uh, mining in India.
but I can guide you to yet another interesting discussion. Please visit our website, it's simple, minerals at CSEP. We have a series called Mining Matters Dialogues where Ganesh is speaking with uh, Mr. Mathai and that, that's a wonderful interview uh, called Mining Matters and we, it's just a click away when you, when you go to Minerals website. Now I think, uh, uh, thank you, uh, actually Mr. Mathai had said that he would need much more time. I requested, I requested and maybe he, he, he agreed and thank you very much. Uh, so uh, next for, uh, for the discussion because there is a lot going on at the Ministry of Mines, Dr. Dermal who is with us has been introduced already but she has been on the various bilateral meetings uh, on critical mineral strategy including bilateral talks with Germany, Australia, Russia, Zimbabwe. More recently she was the chairperson of the committee that has declared the uh, 30 minerals as India's critical mineral and, and we had been interacting with you during, during the writing of that report also. So I think two questions if you can briefly address in next 10 minutes are like many other countries India has now declared the list of critical minerals. What has been the underlying methodology if you can uh, tell us about that and second what steps the Ministry of Mines has taken to secure resilient supply chains and the role of Kabil to, to, of which you have been going to the meetings. Thank you very much and please take 10 minutes over to you. Six months back, I think almost in a year back, CSCP came to Ministry of Mines and they have given this presentation about the critical minerals which they have identified for the country. We were not uh, uh, kind of thinking about identifying the minerals which are critical for the country at that time. Subsequently, we started kind of digging out our old files and find, trying to find out whether any work has been done on the critical minerals in India. And we found that uh, some time back, Niti Aayog has come up with a list. Then the Geological uh, Survey of India has come up with another list. And then, of course, Kabil has been given the target of identifying, I mean, securing um, 12 minerals uh, overseas India. So that's the time then we thought it's time we need to come up with a list which uh, is uh, comprehensive, taking into account the requirement of different sectors. Um, so first what we did is we studied the, re the list which were prepared by other countries like uh, USA, UK, Korea, then uh, Australia, European Union. Uh, we did a very simple thing. We just listed all the uh, lists of all the countries and we found out which are the common uh, minerals which is coming in all their list. So we came out with uh, 69 minerals which are common in all their uh, lists which are published by the different uh, countries. Then we circulated these 69 minerals to different ministries of the government of India. Uh, we circulated it to power, MNRE, agriculture, METI, uh, pharmaceuticals, um, uh, agriculture. So then we requested them, Department of Atomic Energy also, we requested them, you please go through the list, you tell us whether this list uh, include your mineral, which is very critical for you, for which you are dependent on other countries or which is kind of um, uh, without which your major work cannot be taken up. We had a series of discussion with these ministries. We made them to understand because when we talk about mineral, say, they are not much concerned about the minerals which are going into ma making in a chip or a semiconductor or they are more into the production of semiconductor. They are not into the 
uh, inputs for those. So we had had series of discussion with them. Then they came up. Each of the ministry gave us the list, which are important for their own sectors. And then what we did is we then went back to CSCP. We went to IEA, International Energy Agency. We'd had discussion with CEW. So we involved the think tanks in this. And we tried to understand uh, how they have come up with their uh, list of minerals. And what we found is that uh, CSCP is using the Euro EU technology, and we tried to use the same technology for assessing, the same methodology for assessing the criticality index. But uh, then we had some difficulty because um, data was, uh, the reliability of the data was a little concern for us. So uh, instead of going for uh, that, uh, uh, substitutability index and cross-cutting index and all those, um, uh, uh, especially the GVA multiplier factor, we had some difficulty because we are we wanted to be sure that whatever data we use is perfect and it's not questionable at any point of time. So we uh, then came back, I worked out the, our resource, resource availability within the country and for all the minerals which are identified and then uh, the import dependency for these minerals and also economic importance of this mineral. And based on this, we this in economic importance and the supply risk based on the import dependency and the availability of these minerals within the country, we finalized and uh, came back with this list of 30 minerals, but our list is like we have not uh, taken out the RE we take, took as a single mineral, but as you know, there are 17 minerals in that. So we think that we have taken into account the current requirement of different sectors, as well as the current resource, resource av reserve availability and the import dependency while finalizing these uh, minerals. But we also know that this is not a static kind of list. This is dynamic. This has to be revisited with the change in technology. So while submitting the report, we have recommended to the government that this report, this list need to be revisited at a periodic um, interval as decided by the government. So we hope that uh, because it's only two weeks, a week before we were publishing our our uh, list, Australia came up with a revised list. So it's dynamic. But we think that for the time being, we have done our due diligence, uh, taking into the requirement of different ministries. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and it had, it was pleasure uh, meeting and discussing with you and the secretary and other officers the work that we had started three years ago. Actually, our first paper was published, uh, brief paper was published three years ago in 2020 on skewed critical minerals and what risks India would uh, India is likely to go through. Thank you very much for uh, coming and uh, presenting that. And it, it was wonderful attending the event at India International Center where the report was released. I think then well, once we had Mr. Madhai and we had the government uh, representation, it, it's my pleasure that we have the private sector uh, views now with us. And uh, I welcome Mr. Pankaj Satija who has been introduced. He is a co-chair. Of, uh, on the FIKI Mining Committee and uh, other introduction has been given but I think the one or two things that I wanted to speak about Mr. Satija is that he spoke on securing critical mineral supply chains for India's transition towards 2030 uh, in, a, in a FIKI conference where uh, he quoted us and presented the our earlier study not, not the recent study uh, and he has also been talking about the new age energy uh, minerals. Mr. Satija mentions that the new age and critical minerals must no longer be treated like bulk minerals 
and the industry must find ways to increase the scale of mineral supply while maintaining profitability. So two questions that we uh, raised for his discussion uh, in 10 minutes. <laughs> Uh, what challenges does the private sector face in exploration and mining of critical minerals? A. B. What role should be should the private sector play in integrating with global critical mineral value chains? Because once you have lithium, then what? What do I do with it unless we are uh, connected with, with the value chains, processing, beneficiating, etc.? And how do environmental and social externalities affect the decision to process these minerals domestically versus overseas. Over to you, uh, Mr. Satija, and thank you for being uh, with us. Thank you very much. So before I take you to the future challenges, let me take you to the history also. So this story belongs to a person who was born in 1855 in Bengal, he studied in St. Javier's College, 74 uh, he got one Gilchrist scholarship which helped him to go to Royal School of Mines in London. He completed his graduation, came back to India in 1980 80, 80, and he joined GSI. In GSI, he discovered uh, one of the well-known deposit of Dali Rajhara which became the basis of Bhilai steel plant. He was given the responsibility of finding the coal mines in Darjeeling, which he could do successfully. After separating from GSI in 1903, he found one of the best deposit, which encouraged Tata Steel to put up a steel plant in Jamshedpur. And Odisha got its first mine. And today, if Odisha produces more than 50% of Indian iron ore production, the credit goes to him, Dr. P. N. Bose. Now, there are many things which I have not uh, told in the this storytelling. He didn't have a vehicle to go. Roads were not motor available. He didn't have the GPS to find out the location. He didn't have the medical facilities to stay in the remote area. And he stayed in the camp with human-animal conflict. But he did so many things which paved the path of industrial revolution in India. In today's OTT language, bas ek banda hi kafi hai. <laughs> so that was his background. And then many other geoscientists collaborated. They came, new discoveries were made, and India saw its industrial revolution. So when we are talking about Industry 4.0, we talk about so many minerals, but we forget that Industry 1.0 when steam was there, we needed coal. Only thing, the number from one mineral, it has gone to 40. But minerals were always for the backbone of industrial revolution. So things went very smoothly till 1990s. And late 90s, we saw many fly-by-night operators coming into the mining area, which was very lucrative for making more and more money. And then many commissions were constituted, Mr. Mathai was saying. And Shah Commission came, Loka Hekta report came in Karnataka, and miners who were supposed to be in the mines, they were found in the court. And 2015, the new act came. And uh, what it has done, that in a third way, 3.5.6, it is written, Yodhivano Rathkara Karmaraya Manishina. I mean, metal and the mining industry, people, they are treated as Manishis, the learned and the wise person. And Dr. P. N. Bose was also invited by Raja of Mayurbhanj in 1903. But by 2015, the miners and metal were seen in the court with all the bad names. So that is the transition. I can say that we reached the nadir at that point of time. And that damage what it has done, that mining is no longer seen as an as a industry which is, has little prestige. So it has lost its attractiveness to attract the talent. That is one thing which it has done. Secondly, it has created mistrust also between the different constituents. And that's why uh, the policies were made that it should have more and more transparencies and auctions was introduced. Uh, the explorations uh, were given by the NMIT. And the private sector participation which were there in the earlier time got its, lost its charm because 
the minerals were not to be given on first come first serve or on your application but it was an auction so most of the mining companies they have a typical setup of greenfield geologist stopped because there is no point in exploring and applying for leases because the leases were not supposed on the your application but on the auction so it was like a stand still and you have to borrow words of dr bashir badr ki main apne hi raah mein deewar ban ke baitha hu wo aayega bhi to kis raaste se aayega so this was the scenario in 2015 16 government took lot of actions and mt came and uh, 4000 6 2000 4266 crore have been deposited as on 30th november 2022 Seven fifty crores, five five twenty crores have been spent also, but uh, the private sector participation is not there in exploration. So if you compare with Canada, it is thirty three thousand crore. If you compare with Australia, it is nineteen thousand crore. So of late, there has been a structural change uh, in the mining, which which has to be seen internally and from the external perspective also. so if you ask me what should be done the private sector participation risk reward ratio has to come how it has to come again uh, government has also brought a stakeholder consultation in february uh, this year only that the junior miners can uh, go for the bidding and the reverse bidding and then once it is auction they will get certain share i am sure the uh, the final footprint or final blueprint will have much more encouragement and excitement for the private players to participate and mining industry will also have its own charm which used to be earlier government has instituted sustainable development framework star rating of mines have come and slowly the miners will do better things and it will attract new talents to to be in the mining and the processing industry so my two immediate if you ask me these are the things which i wanted to ask from the exploration point of view uh from environmental point of view uh, when we talk about critical minerals so as has been spoken by the previous speakers also it has to be three prong approach one is by product because we have lot of tailings and we know the records few years back we have a track record bad track record of one fly ash failure in every two months and we have seen dam failure in brazil and others so how we can go towards zero waste policy because this was also an initiated in national mineral policy also so first approach should be on the by products uh, from the tailings because we have also gold was being talked about so lot of gold tailings are there in kolar how we can recover from there and there are many other uh, tailing dams which are good potential for by products so that is one direct excavation and mining will come only when you have a proved resource so whenever people talk about mining i personally feel that mining is very similar to pharmaceutical companies you take 1000 trials to come out with one vaccine so in mining also you go 2000 prospects out of 1000 you come to 100 which had certain potential out of 100 you come to 10 which can be mined and one becomes the successful commercial mining so the money part should not be seen from the first which is successful it should also take into account of the thousand unsuccessful attempts also so unless that reward is there commensurate to the risk uh, the investment will not come environmental point of view uh, i mean i would say that it should not be seen from the legal perspective is more ethical and more moral so athar ved bhumi sukta it's very clearly <coughs> mentioned mata bhumi putraham prithvya and is it also mention how you should dig the earth it says that yate bhumi viknami chipram tadapi rohatu mate marmam vimagrari mate hridam arpipam oh mother earth whenever i break or dig something it should recover or relief replenish as early as possible and i should not test the vitality of your uh, core so that is the ethos which were there in indian system legally you can say that if you violate you will be penalized so then people will find out the ways how to deviate from those those uh, rules and that's why miners were in bad time <laughs> critical minerals will have a different ball game different perspective in terms of mining and in terms of 
beneficiation of the processing. It's not simple uh, cleaning and washing of ore by water, which has been done in the bulk minerals. You will have hydrometallurgical process, you will have pyrometallurgical process, you will be using lot of acids, solvent extraction method, and lot of waste you will generate in terms of waste water, in terms of gases, and that strategy has to be uh, made. The ESG framework for this particular aspect has to be created before we go for that. The third aspect is on recycling, urban mining, which we call, but then also require a different skill set. Because if you are recycling uh, electrical appliance or electronic appliance of 1990 and then 2000 or 2010, <laughs> the constituents of these three products from the same company will be different. So the person who is going to use that for recycling, he should understand that what chemical or mineral constituents are there in these three products of the same company so that different methodology can be used. And in my opinion, India can't wait for one strategy. It has to follow the three strategy together and environmental aspects has to be taken care about. As such, we face uh, uh, in the bulk minerals also because incidentally, if you see the map of minerals in India, and if you superimpose with the forest or with the area which is low in HDI or the area with watershed or, will, or with low HDI, all overlap. And then we have COP15 where it says that by 20, 30, 2030, we'll have 30% of the area protected. So as such, for the bulk minerals, we have a very stressed targets for meeting those environmental norms. With critical minerals, we need to tighten our belt much faster. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Satija. Uh, I thought we are running yes. late. We are running around eight minutes or nine minutes late. Open up for the discussion. Please point your questions to the specific panelists and questions rather than uh, comments. I don't know what I mean. can be answered by anybody. Exploration. There are certain areas which have not been exploited. China has jumped the gun many places. In Myanmar, on our border, there needs to be some exploration by India. Similarly, in the desert sands in Middle East, nobody has gone there. There may be something private companies can do, what Adani has done in Australia. Everybody was criticizing him, Prime Minister, Australians all backed him up. So there are areas where the private sector can go and do what Adani has done. We have to go into research of what thorium derivatives can be got out of the thorium sand we've got. All the major oil companies in the world are investing in new exploration. Is the ONGC and the OIL, do, OIL doing the same? If not, they should sort. Deep sea exploration is a new area. Much more should be spent by the government of India in something which nobody has yet gone into. Because all mine minerals you're talking of, they are on the continental shelf and in the area that have been given. That should not my four points. You can go down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very important observations. And we are also working on deep sea mining. Probably there is a paper lying outside. We have just begun the journey. Yes, please identify your name because this is being recorded. Yeah, my name is uh, Saibul Ghosh. I am the Trade Commissioner from the High Commission of Canada, looking after the mining sector. Uh, my my question to you, ma'am, is that you know we have seen uh, Kabil, and before that we also had seen ICVL at one point of time, and if we now know like you know where ICVL went. So in terms of Kabil. In terms of making it more effective and in terms of sort of pushing it ahead, are there any specific steps being taken as such, you know, to energize Kabul per se, you know, in this current, uh, you know, competitive world? So we'll take three questions. Uh, identify yours. Uh, 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 this gentleman uh, first raised his hand. So identify yourself and then you. Uh, my name is Ramananda Sengupta. I'm with Strat News Global. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Mathai. Sir, um, the security partnership that was formed last year, we were not initially part of that team because I believe it, it, 
because we did not bring sufficient expertise to the table. This year we joined. What has changed in that one year? One Hi. more question. And Hi. Uh, I'm, my, my name is Neha Mishra. I'm an associate fellow from Center for Air Power Studies. Uh, my question is for ma'am uh, So re and also Mr. Mathai. So recently, uh, in Center has allowed around 12 private agencies to uh, explore uh, or do mining with some uh, rules attached. So just uh, wanted to know, because in the past it was uh, banned, like the, the private companies were banned because of some illegal rules, uh, illegal mining and ex exports. So I just wanted to know uh, your thoughts that was it the absence of uh, rules, proper rules to uh, accredit uh, make some accreditation of these private agencies or was it uh, just the mining uh, issue or the exploring issue by these uh, private enterprises? Was it the absence of uh, uh, attention by uh, government or was it the uh, just uh, the corruption by private enterprises? What is your thought on it? Thank you. If we can quickly answer these. <laughs> Um, first, to about Kabil. Uh, yes, Kabil, uh, I do not know. Yes, um, what I can say is um, we are having um, uh, uh, discussions with um, some countries for um, uh, acquiring assets. Basically, Kabil has 12 minerals. Now we are concentrating on lithium and cobalt. And um, uh, there is a lot of talk about Kabul not having enough um, uh, its uh, uh, support, but it's not really correct because um, Kabul is uh, need not be the company who will be acquiring the assets uh, in other countries because Kabul is the front portion which will go have discussions find out the kind of assets available. All the other government companies, many other government companies are also kind of shown their interest in uh, investment. Once the car, once car will do the due diligence for the blocks, other companies like whether it's Coal India or NTPC or some other government companies having enough financial strength will come up and invest. So we are very confident that in a short time Kabul will come up with a few block acquisition in some countries and uh, Australia also we are hopeful that in some time because what we are currently doing is uh, we have identified a few blocks in one or two countries and what we are doing is uh, doing the due diligence for these uh, companies because we need to be sure about the company's strength and the blocks uh, potential before we invest. Uh, so uh, Kabul is fully prepared to invest and we have all the government of India companies, most of the my company uh, PSUs in mining sector from the government side uh, supporting Kabul. So, that is not a problem. The delay is due to the delay or the time which we are taking is mainly for assessing the uh, potential of the blocks. Um, uh, coming to the question of Madam, uh, basically, like it's you cannot say it's illegality of the private companies which has prevented. Uh, uh, private companies from uh, coming into exploration. As Mr. Sadija has told, before 2015, our uh, legal framework was such that any person who apply and get an area, uh, means it's based on application, he get an area, he do exploration, he go to mining. But whatever be the reason, 2015 we have introduced auction as a methodology for allocating the mineral concession. And India is one of the few countries which has auction methodology. And at that time, our law has allowed only the government uh, notified agencies to do the exploration. This is a particular section in the act, which says, and they have to get notified. And at that time, the provision was notification of only government agencies. In 2021, we brought in an amendment in which we can we told the it has made provision for notifying the 
private exploration agency is also for doing the exploration after 2021 then we put in a place some of a place uh, a system of accreditation of private exploration agencies now we have notified 14 agencies and uh, these agencies are getting funding from the national mineral exploration trust for taking up the exploration work it's a it's not anybody's illegality which was created that situation it was the existing legal framework which we have changed thank you and we do have a discussion note on nmet uh, how nmet has been operating and how little participation from private sector has come in come into so we have a full discussion note on that mr mathai any of your observations yeah. please one? I'll take one more round. Uh, yeah, in, in general, I think she has answered the question, but uh, the experience around the world is that uh, usually exploration and production go together. And uh, that is one of the reasons why we don't, haven't been able to attract uh, some of these junior explorers also, because they are not able to convert what their hard work does into effective action. In fact, this uh, lack of knowledge about this extends not only to people like us, but deep inside the government. In 2015, I was personally present when one of the senior most members of this government, uh, remain nameless, was sitting in London and the head of, the chairman of Rio Tinto was sitting across the table and asked him uh, about, and he asked him why he was thinking of leaving India and explained this problem. And he said, do you mean to say when you find a mineral you can't exploit it? And the chairman said, yes, sir. And uh, both of us nodded and took notes. That's all we did. But uh, I'd like to mention something on the uh, mineral security partnership which you asked. Uh, the reasoning, there could be multiple. But when mineral security partnership was created, and I wrote about it in July 2022, a few weeks after it was launched, it emerged from a certain strategy particularly of the OECD countries, the United States, Europe, Japan, Korea, I mean a few others, Australia and others. And in fact, the way it emerged and the way it was announced during a mining conference, very low key and so on, but you know, people understood what it was. One analyst in fact called it a metallic NATO. So that was the kind of backdrop and the Chinese got the message immediately. There were two stinging attacks on it in the global times within a few weeks. So that, I think, is the background. But I think there is a realization that when you're talking about geological assets, Devalon processing in mind, you have to get out of these charmed circle of these 14 countries. And the global south is where much of the action is going to be. The Mineral Security Partnership held a conversation in February this year with four or five African countries. And uh, by now, many of those countries know how to deal with uh, you know, external investors trying to come and sell them a line of goods. I have a feeling getting India in, first of all, we bring a certain geological capacity, a certain scientific ability, plus we have credibility with the global south. That's my hunch, but that's only a hunch. I don't have an exact reasoning for it. But it can make it a far more balanced organization uh, and one to which perhaps will not look confrontational when you are talking to the Chinese. Uh, deep sea mining, uh, sir, we looked at it. We were among the very early pioneers of deep ocean exploration going back to the times of Mrs. Indira Gandhi, that time. And I think we have done a lot of work. We have identified zones. We, I think, even applied for uh, licenses. But there are two factors. One, there's an extremely high cost involved. And you need a concentration of minerals which would make that very high cost immediately viable. And second, today, there are very serious environmental objections to going and churning up the bottom of the ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there, there is a question so that we are not partial from Zoom. Partly, we have al already answered what policies currently exist for critical mineral security and how well are they being implemented. I think in the discussion that we have had, we have already discussed the mineral security partnership and Mr. Mathai has clearly pointed out that incidentally, India is the only developing country in that G7 club 
that was constituted last year as MSP. So we should be we should be happy about it that we have moved a step forward. Uh, this is only to take two more questions. That two uh, one two. So please identify yourself and uh, just a brief question. And I think most of the answers have been given. Uh, I am Professor Shastri. I teach in a management school. So my question is to Madam. See the criticality of mine and minerals is understood because we don't have a resource base. But in the when coming to the question of the major minerals, like say for example, iron ore, see on and off policies by the government, we need to lose the precious foreign contracts, foreign exchange. See, the point is that criticality, every year planning commission will go for meetings and all that. So this is very, very low base iron ore or magnets for our ore. But the things can continue. See, it is very difficult to come get a contract from Japan or China and other things. There is a dog, it's a dog game. Brazil is sitting, Australia is sitting. We will not get the contracts. So all the point in the case of at least major minerals of one establishing criticality, one has to aspire, take into aspect all these aspects of including the foreign exchange earnings, export and other things. Otherwise, the country many times, many a times, we lost contract to Australia and Brazil because they say this high grade yeah, of only this much be, you can export. Be to the question only. My question is the criticality of the major minerals and the criticality of the minor minerals is the wash difference there. One has to take into the aspect of the export earnings also in the case of high grade minerals. Thank you. Thank you. My, uh, yes, one more here. Hello. Hello, I'm Abhishek Sharma, I'm an NSC fellow at Tuxil Institution. Uh, my question is to both Mr. Pankaj and Ms. Meena. Um, particularly if we compare the strategies of uh, developed countries like, Aust uh, like America and South Korea and Australia and even to China, what comes very common is the close working relationship between private sector and government. So uh, my question is like, is there any attempt on the private sector in India to kind of formulate a strategy on their own? and uh, kind of pro, uh, put them to the in front of the government so that there is a close the understanding on, in the government that what the private sector meant because going forward as India wants to develop uh, or capacities in uh, certain sectors uh, sunrise sectors it's very important to have this cohesion uh, so I would like to get the role of private news. sector is fine uh, so two more questions and that's the end Sorry. No, 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 no. But if it can be a question, just, just a question. My name is Anjana Das. I am from Irade. Uh, my question is: Government of India wants to develop its electrolyzer manufacturing capacity, and recently it has invited BEAT for also 1500 megawatt. My feeling is it will be mostly PM type of electrolyzer, but because of its compatibility with variable uh, generation resources, but that needs platinum. So, question is: How government is dealing with Platinum requirement. Yeah, that's too specific a question. But uh, if yeah, quick quickly because I think we can only take questions at the moment. And I assure you, uh, Doctor Chadda, only a question. Uh, so uh, it has been answered partially, but I was just uh, going to ask. My name is Surinder Singh. I work as a carbon analyst. Uh, if uh, uh, Mr. Sathya could answer this, uh, so I'm going to look forward for this seabed paper. But then anyway. Uh, there have been uh, near U.S. Hawaii. There is this specific zone. I'm forgetting the name of where we are exploring seabed for these uh, uh, critical mining mineral needs. Where is this only the money or the technology which is stopping us from doing this seabed exploration, or do you think there is some other reason why we know that these identification security needs to happen, but we still have not been able to do it? Thank you. Thank you, madam. You had a question. I I don't want to miss you. Your uh, thank you. Um, we've talked about exploration, which of course is uh, very important. But what about uh, value addition of minerals? Um, you know, how much of um, an effort is being made by the ministry as well as the industry? Uh, because ultimately, if we talk of critical mineral security and uh, you know making our uh, end use industries like energy resilient, uh, unless we have the processing capability, just you know securing minerals either from abroad or extracting more is not going to really help in uh, those industries. Thank and the you. last question there. Anyone from this side? I've been biased towards that side, but I had your question. 
good evening uh, i'm radeo cha i work as senior manager critical minerals for gmdc uh, similar to the question asked just now when we talk about uh, minerals like rare earth metals and stuff we talk about the entire value chain there are some proprietary technologies involved post the refining and the end use permanent magnet manufacturing and stuff uh, is there anything we are doing in india to promote research in those sectors because we have i think be i believe that we have enough capability in mining processing separation solvent extraction like sir mentioned uh, but uh, post the refining part i think the capability is concentrated with only some countries and only some private players outside uh, i mean ex china some small private players so is there any uh, work being done on that front is what i'd like to ask yeah i think thank you very much i think i can sum up the questions that have been asked in a couple of sentences i think the questions have been is government doing enough to look beyond finding the criticality of the minerals second is what role the private sector should be playing and uh, that is important to look at nmet which we have done and and the third one obviously is i think the all the questions are wanting to know are we are we integrating with the supply chains you know and integrating with the supply chains is an important research area that csep is now looking at and uh, any final remarks from um, very briefly mr sita yeah can i yeah, yeah. So begin with you so uh, many questions were there so we must remember that india is a federal structure okay. while the policies are made at center but then there are different KPIs and different results at different states. So I operate from Odisha. I can very well say that the industrial environment and the support from Odisha government is one of the best in the country. And uh, that's the region which is seen that more than 50% production of iron ore happens in in one state. And uh, Odisha, if I say that it is the capital, mineral capital of India, it is not an exaggeration. however there are many complexities involved with mining as i mentioned that mining area overlaps with uh, forest area area with low sdi area with low uh, left wing extrusion area with uh, um, uh, watershed so and incidentally we have different governments ministries for different so if i am going to do the mining i'll get permission from ministry of mines as well as from the state government but then i have to have forest clearance from mof i have to forest right act uh, i am involving gram sabha from the local government authorities and there are different set of regulations which have its own implication state by state different so thank you uh, madam yeah almost answered like it's like a multidisciplinary approach to mining has starting from mining law making mining allocation to in state government then beneficiation study done by different dsi or labs and then uh, further value addition by the concerned industry sectors it's quite uh, like it's uh, the whole supply chain many ministries many departments state government come into picture i'm sure everybody is doing their own this uh, role and responsibility and also we always consult with each other whether when we make a law we always put it in our website and the state government all the stakeholders including private company state government uh, we get their input and similarly when others are making new program it's all been consulted always so it's a collective effort thank you madam any final thoughts just on the processing and uh, absolutely right value addition is really the name of the game beyond mining uh, we have to get used to i think the fact that uh, it's not going to be very popular there are very powerful lobbies which are going to be working against it um, and the world experience you can go from one extreme uh, of by two in china where the process of extracting 1 kilo of uh, rare earths takes 1000 kilos of 1000 tons of rock and it's a real mess and on the other in hamburg you have a copper smelter right in the heart of the city and it functions 
But in India, we have the NIMBY problem, not in my backyard. We want all the minerals possible, but not in my backyard. We have to find a biomedia. Thank you very much. And uh, it remains for me to say that this turned out to be an interesting session, uh, education for us and the team, and uh, that people are still with us, even though we are 15 minutes above time. But uh, I will not close before saying um, my thanks to Dr. Lavish Bandari, uh, particularly for staying through the session. And uh, I have requested him to say a few words. He is taken over as the president of CSEP a couple of months ago. And uh, he, is, he is my colleague from National Council of Applied Economic Research. He leads the climate change and sustainability research at CSEP and has published widely on sustainable livelihoods, industrial, economic, and social reforms in India. He has taught economics at Boston University and IIT Delhi <coughs> and has been the managing editor of the Journal of Emerging Finance, the Market Finance, and worked with us at National Council of Finance while Dr. Mohan was also there. So I'm so, uh, so over to you, Lavish, for any final thoughts. Thank you. I, I thank you very much. Um, well, uh, as uh, What's happening here is that uh, two amazingly passionate and energetic researchers under the watchful eyes of Dr. Chanda with that experience and with all the support and vision that all of you are giving to us has, is really creating magic. Uh, this whole space, there's a lot of action that is happening. Uh, some unfortunately believe that critical minerals are a defensive reaction to an emerging problem. Actually, critical minerals are an opportunity, unlike any that we are facing right now. Uh, it's not just about India. Critical minerals are giving us global opportunities. And that's how we see it. So essentially, the, all the inputs that have come in, which is about, of course, about exploration, about, uh, about international relations, uh, about setting up uh, the processing facilities, about the time path of when these investments and actions would be required, are all subjects of great interest to us. Uh, so I would just request all of you that in case you have any thoughts, any ideas, please do continue to interact and, uh, and, and engage with us. So thank you very much and good luck to everyone. Thank you once again to, to all of you for being here. Please join us for a cup of tea, coffee out, out, outside. Thank you very much for your patience that you stayed all along.